on this edition of Native Report. We experience life on the powwow trail through the photography of Ivy Vineo. That had a big impression. On me. We interview impression elder statesman and, and former vice president work, Walter Mondale. And we continue with part three of Inalik Little Diomed, a documentary about an island in the Bering Strait. We also learn something new about Indian country and hear from our elders on this Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community, the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe, and the Blandin Foundation. Hi, welcome to Native Report. I'm Stacy Thunder. Ivy Vineo is an accomplished photographer. In her first solo exhibit, Namajig, Honoring Our Traditions, the life and experience of the Powwow Trail is documented. On this fall day, there is a special gathering inside the Gamaji building in downtown Duluth. Photographer Ivy Vineo premieres her exhibit, images documenting moments and people at several powwows in the region. I love being at powwows um, and seeing families together. I'm a historian at heart. I, that's what I got my degree in at UMD, and that's how I see it's an art. Photography is an art, but it also can educate, and that's what I think I do. I work at UW-Superior and for years, I've been there 15 years and uh, maybe seven or eight years ago, uh, we got a high-end camera for, for, to document our events and, and I guess it, I just took it on myself to be the photographer and, and I've been taking photos ever since for my job. And then about four years ago, my husband Arnie bought me a really high-end camera and um, real high-powered lens and I fell in love with that camera and then I just started to go on the powwow trail and document what I like to call document a cultural event. On average, Ivy snaps anywhere from 400 to 500 photos while attending powwows. Of these, she may end up with 20 that stand out. I've been taking powwow photos for about four years now. War Cry is the one that I took at um, the Veterans Powwow in Sawyer, and um, it's of Ben Spears. Um, he's a Red Lake member, just a wonderful man and beautiful dancer. And I was, it was one of those times where I was in the right place at the right time, and he came around the the arena and I was kind of standing over here and he came around and he did one of those war cries and when he came back around like he was getting closer to me I'm like oh please do it again please do it again I had brought my camera up and my finger was on that shutter and uh, he did it again and I you know snapped it and that's the photo that that I got. Another striking image is that of a father and his daughter. That photo um, I actually entitled Dancing Together and it's of uh, Gordon Finday and his daughter uh, Kylie and I took it this past summer in Grand Portage and same thing I was just kind of sitting there and they came around and I saw that they were interacting with each other while they were dancing. They were talking and she was just looking up at him and it just, I get goosebumps when I when I, when I saw that, and again, I pulled my camera up and I captured it, and I re it really says a lot about powwow culture because it involves families and the importance of family, and I think that photo symbolizes that, that value. 
powwow royalty, and that was taken last year at Mille Lacs powwow, traditional powwow, and um, two, two summers ago. And those two girls, uh, young women, um, Taya and Jasmine, are in the same grade as in the same grade as my son and at the same school and so I know them very well and so when I saw them I think we were kind of by a food stand and they were getting slushies or something like that and and um, I, I asked them if they would pose for a photo and, and and that's what I got and you know it really says a lot because it they're representing their their tribe their, their tribal nation um, with the beaded crown and, and their banners and I think it's it's very cool. I photograph every style of dance. The only style that I don't have in this 16 uh, set of photos is men's fancy but I, I have jingle, I have uh, fancy shawl, traditional, men's traditional, uh, grass dance. They're all, they're, they're, they're all my favorites, you know. I go from one to the other and like, um, this is my favorite, but I really, I really like them all equally. History hasn't done very well in documenting or representing Native people very well. I think of the old black and white photographs, historical photographs of Native Americans that are, you know, they're, they're in headdresses and they're holding a gun or they pose them just a certain way and you can tell that the photograph was taken by an outsider from someone outside of the culture and I feel like with my photographs I'm you know respectful and I'm, I'm shooting the photographs in their own outfits and their own communities and in the way that they would want to be photographed. You know, I, I am part Ojibwe and I feel good that I can represent, you know, our people in a good way, in a way that they would want to be represented. Did you know that Walter Mondale once served on a subcommittee that changed Indian education policy? Mondale served as the 42nd Vice President of the United States under President Jimmy Carter and as a United States Senator from Minnesota from 1964 until 1976. During his time as a Senator, he served on the Special Subcommittee on Indian Education, originally chaired by Senator Robert F. Kennedy from New York. After Senator Kennedy was assassinated in 1968, his brother, Senator Edward Kennedy of Massachusetts, chaired the subcommittee and completed the report. The finished report was entitled, Indian Education, a National Tragedy, a National Challenge. The report played a significant role in the development of the 1972 Indian Education Act, a landmark piece of legislation establishing a comprehensive approach to meeting the needs of American Indian and Alaska Native students. The key aspects of the original authority have been retained through subsequent legislation. These acts deal with American Indian education from preschool to graduate school and reflect the diversity of government involved in Indian education. Next, Tad Johnson sits down with Vice President Walter Mondale, who worked on major state and federal legislation in the 60s and 70s that made a positive impact for Native nations. He was also one of the few who spoke out against injustice, inequality, and how the United States viewed Native America. Sitting in his office at the Minneapolis law firm of Dorsey & Whitney, Vice President Walter Mondale reflects on the lessons his father taught him as a boy growing up and how he applied those lessons to his years of public service. What I did learn was from my dad, who was a devout, progressive, 
Christian minister about um, how we owe every person respect, every person is a child of God, and that whenever we discriminate against people, it's a sin. And I kind of went into politics with that idea and still have it. My recollection is I made, I, I tried to make friends with uh, uh, Indian leaders, with uh, young Indians coming up. I tried to be a, an office that they could come to and talk about their problems. I didn't see them as adversaries. I saw them as people I could work with. I was, although I didn't know much about it, I was convinced that that the that the, that the Indians had been unfairly treated, and that uh, we need, there's a lot of justice work that needed to be done. And the more I got into it, the more I became persuaded that big reforms were needed. As Attorney General for Minnesota, and later as a United States Senator, he was able to reform Indian policy. Along the way, he made friends with many tribal leaders, most notably the Red Lake Nation chairman, the late Roger Jourdain. Roger was my buddy. I mean, we, uh, he would get me up there for uh, Indian dances. He gave me a headdress. But we would talk serious policy, and he'd come out to Washington, um, and I would see him there, or I would see him in Minneapolis, or I'd see him up in Red Lake. Whenever he came to Washington, he always had a place in the White House with me. And I remember he brought uh, some high school kids from Red Lake, to, and they wanted to dance somewhere. So we set up a platform out on the White House lawn there, and the president came out with me, and we watched them dance, and they, we, we did our best to help. And I made many friends uh, during those years. The 1960s and 70s were a time of change on many fronts, including Indian country. This was a time which I think was, it, it looks very good in American history, when there, there was a bunch of young, progressive senators. You may have named a couple of them, Bobby and Teddy, but I think there were a lot of people of like mind, like myself there, that wanted to correct things in America that needed adjustment. And one was this idea of what I call paternalism, where Indians were, could only function if they were under guardianship. If they would get money, it ought to be under trusteeship. If, um, the, if there was education, somehow there had to be a bureau there or somebody else overseeing the education. The idea that Indians could be just as capable of handling their affairs, just as interested in their children and their future as the rest of us, had not yet, it was not dawning as quickly as it should. I can remember, don't want to use names here, <clears throat> when we started making these changes, an old older senator, nice man, but he, we were trying to do some of this self-determination so the Indians could, can, control their own lives and feel good about it. Uh, and he said, you know, are you sure you're going down the right path? Do you, you think they're ready uh, to do this for themselves? Don't you think we should wait until they're better prepared? And I said, you know, I think, I think we've held on way too long. I think that they they're just as capable of figuring out their lives as we non-Indians are. And the system we've had has not worked. It started out with trying to basically eliminate the Indian, and then we had a hundred years of making a white man out of the Indian. None of it has worked. It's time to just let Indians guide their own lives help educate their children to feel good about themselves. As a senator, Walter Mondale sat on the Senate Subcommittee on Indian Education and helped to pass the landmark Indian Education Act of 1972. We worked very hard on that committee. 
and we traveled a lot around the country. We had a lot of hearings. We introduced legislation on the Indian Education Act, which passed. And the theory of the new act was parental control, local control, uh, teaching materials that fit children and their histories that uh, where, where children, when they read it, can see things about themselves that uh, strengthen their sense of self-worth. Every child needs that. Other key pieces of legislation followed during the Carter administration. One that had a great impact was the Tribally Controlled Community College Assistance Act of 1978. That's one of the most exciting things. Um, if you go to Fond du Lac, the have a community college there. It's one of the best in the country in all, and I think we have a couple other locations in Minnesota. Uh, there's 70 Indian community colleges now in the country. Most of them are big successes. I think that we started pushing them when I was in the Senate, and I think Carter signed a bill establishing an, an, a nationwide Indian community college program with some grants and help. I think it's been very successful. There was a period of eight or ten years there when the American public were electing people. There was Lyndon Johnson with all of his problems, but Lyndon was good on this stuff, and um, Hubert Humphrey, of course, and, and a progressive court with Earl Warren, and, and it was a time for real change. You know, that whole idea of opportunity and dignity and mercy. That, that was the keystone of that era that I talked about. And wherever you went, people were trying to do something to improve lives. A lot of good was done. I remember arguing with the priest over some theology because I didn't, I thought it was, I didn't think it was logical. And so I argued about it. And I remember I was about seven then when I was arguing about something like that. But we were, we, we, we had to go to church and we had to do all the stuff there. There was no, and as you know, with boarding schools and how they were designed. When I taught federal Indian policy, I asked my students uh, what, they, they were just aghast at boarding school, and I asked them what, uh, what was the most ingenious thing that the white man did for, with the Indian, and they couldn't come up with anything. They thought it was all awful, and whether it's awful or not, boarding schools really worked, didn't they? When you think about what the, what the government wanted to do, you have to look at something from their point of view as well as yours. Now, from our point of view, it was awful. From their point of view, it was brilliant. They, we, we didn't get to speak our language. We, didn't, um, we, we, we were taken away from our families. We weren't raised with our families. And I was talking to my father, and I was annoyed because I couldn't speak, I can't speak fluent Ojibwe. And he looked at me, he said, you did good in school, though, didn't you, my girl? We continue with part three of Inalik Little Diomede, a documentary produced by Jeannie Green from Alaska. In this segment, we learn about the history of the village in the middle of the Bering Strait. There are two stores in Diomede, but prices are high due to the cost of shipping. And there are often times when bad weather keeps flights out of Diomede for weeks on end. The hardest part is traveling. Going out of Diomede is easy, but trying to come back is really tough. You can get stranded in wells for weeks or months. On September 25th, 
an 8.0 earthquake struck Japan. A tsunami warning was issued all the way from the Seward Peninsula north to Little Diomede. When news hit Diomede, the siren was sounded in town and the men began moving boats up onto higher ground. Preparation is the key to survival in the Bering Straits. Fortunately, a tsunami never formed. It's easy to see how different and sometimes complex it can be to live in Diomede. From the limited barge service to the seasonal plane service, living on Little Diomede has its challenges. Well, you have to learn how to live with your basics because it's hard to get stuff out here and it's really expensive. You have to be able to handle all the isolation because we don't have we don't have everyday mail service. We don't have everyday airplanes like all the other villages. And the past year or so, we don't even have any kind of communication with Alaska because we don't get the ARCS channel. And all our satellite TV comes from California. Perhaps their limited contact with the outside keeps them more grounded in their own culture. They were raised on the foundation of a subsistence lifestyle. They know how to read the water and the sky. They know where to find myrrh eggs. And they know how to survive on the place some call the rock. You have to know the, the current. You have to know the weather situation. Why is the, the clouds are forming? Why are they dying, dying down? Which way is the wind blowing? Is the most important things out here where the weather always a thing that we have to rely on, especially the current. From the elders to the youth, and so on and so on, the ways of the Iqmaliut have been passed down from generation to generation. Orville Sr. recalls the first time he went hunting with the adults and elders. By my youngest time, I think I remember when I was about 16 or 17, I think that's it first time I went with the, uh, the hunting crew. I remember the elders were in charge, really. Now it's, uh, I've, I've been some, I spent some time in the military. It was like military. You gotta have discipline in the boat. You gotta be organized. You gotta be prepared for anything. So the elders those days were just, the strict people. They know what, how it's done, you know, the proper way. Mainly you survive, how to survive, how to make a living, how to prepare for the upcoming weather situation and stuff like that. We have to be prepared, you know, those days. There were three villages here on the when I was growing up, there were three villages, existing villages, one up the north side of Big Diamond, one on the other side, the main village and this village over here. So these two islands were pretty much together. They have the same language, same way of living then. So, so we have relatives from there. So pretty, pretty close those days. They have to make their own clothes. I was growing up, we had hardly have any boots like we have now, like tennis shoes, where you don't see any tennis shoes. Uh, most of them was seal skin, what you use in the wintertime. Seal skin and caribou for parka and all this, all the, all the furs and stuff we traded. They traded from the mainland. When I was growing up, there wasn't any television or, or even a radio, you know. So we sit, sat down and listened to our grandfathers telling stories. It might be friction type, I mean, uh, fictional type of stories in Eskimo way, in our way. And uh, usually some, there'd be a mystery or so, you know. It's like reading a book or watching television. Some stories along, it might take four days for one good story to be told. <coughs> Back on the North Trail, 
Andrew has spotted a walrus lazily floating up the coast. Andrew does his best to wake the sleeping beast, but he is downwind of the walrus, and the wind is blowing a steady 15 knots. After a half hour of waiting for the walrus to drift closer, Andrew takes aim. Although the walrus has lived to see another day, it may soon again meet Andrew now that spring is approaching, and it might not be so lucky next time. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us at nativereport.org and on Facebook. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors on Native Report. I'm Stacy Thunder. Hope to see you next time. Stacy Thunder is a member of and legal counsel for the Red Lake Nation. And Tad Johnson is a member of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa and is chair for the American Indian Studies Department on the campus of the University of Minnesota Duluth. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community, the Malax Band of Ojibwe, and the Blandon Foundation. <laughs>